Chapter 19, it's also an honor for me to have my wife with me. Sometimes I travel and my wife doesn't get to go, but uh, I thank the Lord that she was able to be with me this weekend, and we can both share this weekend together with friends and with the family of God. Uh, you may not know this, probably most of you don't, but years ago when this church was meeting in a school and it was very, very new, I preached at this church for the very first time. And so through the years, I've been back a couple of times, but always had this church in my heart and prayers. And I was impacted by that very young church then, the fervor and the freshness of first-generation Christians who came straight out of the world and into the faith in this church. And I thank God for what He's done here through the years. And what a solid, great, beautiful church you have. I love the remodel. It's amazing. Amen. Why don't you give your pastor and your leadership team a hand? Because they have done a phenomenal job here. Amen. They are respected across the United Pentecostal Church. Luke 19, 28. Luke 19, 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. He's talking about Jesus. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why you are loosing it, thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus and threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. What an unusual story in your Bible. And I want to speak to you from this story today on the subject, the issue is ownership. The issue is ownership. You may be seated. Well, I was thinking about this story and wondering, you know, what in the world is this all about? So let me just say it to you like this. Today, you don't know this, but today is a very special day in your life. Today, you have just become the proud owner of a brand new automobile. Congratulations, a gift from Abundant Life Church. We didn't want to tell you what it was. No. Every first-time guest... I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm leaving soon, sooner than I thought. You just sign the papers in the finance office. A business manager turned the keys over to the salesman. The salesman's taking you out to your brand new car. I don't mean a used car. I've got some of those. A brand new car. And he's getting ready to explain all the features to you of the car that you just bought. This thing has got every feature imaginable, lots of power under the hood, but then power everything, power seats, power windows, power door locks, power steering wheel, power moonroof, deluxe leather interior, that new car smell. Can you smell it? Smell it. Can you smell it? Not the little thing they give you at the car wash. I'm talking about the real new car smell. It's got four wheel analog brakes, it's got GPS navigation, has Bluetooth technology with a hands-free telephone system, has intelligent cruise control, dual temperature controls, it's got a six-speaker audio system, 
Bose 2 channel 10 speaker premium audio system. It's got an AM, FM, CD, and DVD with MP3 playback capability. It's yours. It's got XM radio, rear view monitor, and it even comes with cup holders. Isn't that amazing? It's got cup holders. And no one, it's not a pre-owned vehicle. No one has ever owned this car. No one's even driven this car for a test drive, and it's yours. And the salesman walks you out there. He's explained all of these features to you. The keys are in the ignition. You're saying your final goodbyes to this salesperson. I mean, this person has been your closest friend for the last two hours. Why is it you can buy a house quicker than you can buy a car? But this man has been your best friend. He has hammered out the deal of the century for you. No one has ever gotten a better deal in this dealership than you just got. He has risked his job for you. He's gone to bat with the business manager, the finance manager, the sales manager. They all said no, but he used his vast influence to get this deal for you. He even called corporate headquarters and he got them to say yes. And you are so pumped. You are so excited. You cannot wait to get in your new ride and eat up some pavement. And this salesman finally quit shaking your hand and smiling at you and you look over at your brand new ride that you're getting ready to get in and ride away and you see something that stuns you. There's a stranger sitting in your car on the driver's side his hands are on the steering wheel. And he's looking up at you and he's smiling real big. And you're wondering, what in the world is going on? He's checking out all the accessories and the features. Run, run, revving the engine up. Adjusting the remote mirrors just for his height and size. And you're just kind of freaking out right now because this is not what you had in mind. You don't know whether to throw yourself in front of the car, jump on the hood, Smash out the window. And this driver sitting in your car is not panicked, not upset. He's smiling, waving at you. And you motion for him, you know, roll down the window. Rolls down the window. And you say, hey, what are you doing in my car? Where do you think you're going? He just keeps right on smiling like he's your best friend too. And he just says these simple words to you. The Lord has need of it. And he rolls the window back up puts it in drive, and pulls out of the dealership, and you wave goodbye to taillights, and you go, I hope you enjoy it. Are you coming back? How long are you keeping it for? The Lord has need of it. Isn't that a crazy illustration? What would you do? How many of you would be honest enough with me to say that you would have trouble with that scenario? Yeah, just a little bit of trouble with that scenario. But when I read this story in the Bible, it's a lot like that. When Jesus came to this earth, he did not own much. He owned very, very little. He wanted to teach, and he borrowed a boat and pushed out from shore and taught the people back on the land. When he wanted to go to a supper, he borrowed a house for the Last Supper. He didn't have a home. He told disciples, the foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. When he was crucified, all he had was a clothes on his back. And they stripped him of them. They gambled for his garments, for his robe, parted his garments. And when he died, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He didn't own his own grave. He didn't know him very much at all. And in this story, Jesus Christ is preparing for what we call the triumphal entry into Jerusalem where he will present himself as the king. And because he didn't have a donkey to ride on, he needed to borrow one. And the way he went about it was really kind of strange. Now, somewhere in Bethphage... There was a man who owned donkeys. They were his. And he raised them evidently. And one of his donkeys had had a beautiful colt. And it was just about riding age. I would guess about two years old. And he had never put a blanket 
a saddle, a bridle. No man had ever sat on that young colt. But he had him in the city of Bethphage and he had him tied right outside a house at a place, the King James says in the book of Mark, where two ways met. That's kind of interesting to me because crossroads are pretty strategic in our lives, right? Because it's at a place where two ways meet that we often trade our earthly ambitions for a heavenly ambition and our earthly values for spiritual values. And the disciples go to this city. Jesus says, go to the city. You'll see a colt tied, I guess, to like a hitching rail. When you see it, just go untie it and bring it to me. And if anybody says anything, you just tell them, the Lord, whoever that is, you know, to that colt owner, the Lord has need of him. I don't know. I just kind of imagine the disciples going into Bethphage, maybe a little tentative, maybe just a little bit reluctant, you know, because this is like grand theft. You know what I'm saying? This is somebody's donkey. Grand theft auto. He goes into the town, and there's the donkey tied, these two disciples of Jesus. And they go over to the hitching rail, and they untie the donkey, And just, you know, like the thing that I have feared has come upon me, that scripture in the Bible, and just the thing that they feared that Jesus kind of referred to, the owners of the donkey said, Hey, why are you untying our colt? They had those lines down pat. The Lord has need of it. And nothing else happened. They didn't call the police. No alarm went off. He didn't have a club tied to his mouth like a bit. They just walked off with that man's donkey because the Lord hath need of it. It makes me believe that the owner of the donkey understood that the real issue is ownership. Who really owns that donkey? I may have the papers that say it belongs to me, but if the Lord needs it, then I know there's a higher law that says that He is the owner of the donkey and it really belongs to Him. Now, I know that sounds really fun right now, but you have some stuff that has your name on it. It's in your house. It's in your car. It's titled in your name. Maybe they are the children that sit under your table, put their feet under your table. But this principle in the Bible supersedes human ownership and teaches the principle that when it is all said and done, we really don't own anything. The Bible says you brought nothing into this world and you will take nothing out of it when you leave. And everything you have, including life and breath, is a gift from Almighty God. You may have worked for it. You may have slaved for it. You may have gone to bat for to get it. But when it's all said and done, it is Jesus Christ who owns everything. And as a child of His, the issue is ownership. Now remember this cult was unbroken. No man had ever sat on it. Now I've never broken a horse before, but I have friends who have. And it's dangerous, and it's tedious, and it has to be done gradually over a period of time. And while this donkey, this colt, was in the owner's possession, he had to be tied. But when they brought him to Jesus, an animal that had never had a saddle or a bridle on him allowed the God of the universe who had come in flesh to ride him into Jerusalem in a triumphal entry to say that here, Jerusalem, your Messiah, has come. 
how submissive that animal was to the God who created it. And it makes me wonder if one day God chose to saddle me with the responsibility or a ministry or a sacrifice, if I would be as submitted to the will of God as that animal was to the will of God when he was pressed into divine service. The Lord has need of it. You see, the issue really is ownership. Your time, your talent, your treasure. The way to sum up who you are. You have time that is a gift from God. Every breath. You have talent that God gave you. He put talents in us. Some more than others. But every person who breathes in this building today received a gift from God of special abilities and talents that really belong to Him and are to be used for His glory and not your personal advancement. Your time and your talent belong to Him and your treasure, believe it or not, it belongs to Him. The Bible said that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The cattle of a thousand hills. He said the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Everything that exists belongs to Him. In fact, I'll go a little farther in the Scripture. 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you, everybody say I, I. you are not your own. Now wait a second. I thought it was my life. I'll live it my way. But Jesus said, if you save your life, you're going to lose it. If you try to live it your way, you're going to make a disaster out of your life. But if you will lose your life, Jesus said, for my sake and the gospels, you will find it. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and 20, you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or God's property. He owns all you have and all you are, your time, your talent, Your treasure is not your own, but it is His. Amen. Now, I grew up with ambitions like most people have. And I know you did too. And I had my life goals and dreams and plans. I was confused about them, but I had my idea of the way my life should go so that I could at least be somewhat successful. I'll confess to not having great ambitions. But when God began to come by my life and He untied me from my earthly ambitions, I will tell you that God's plans for my life were not worse, not just different, they were better. He put me in the zone of how He made me and where I would succeed and I would make a difference in the kingdom of God. I can tell you that when He untied me from my plans, He connected me to an eternal purpose that was much bigger and better. But I had to understand that the issue is ownership. I will never forget being 16 years old at a Florida youth camp where I grew up and the preacher was preaching and he had in his hand some coins. And he said... What right does the coin have to say that him to him that owns it, spin me this way? That coin cannot say to the coin owner, I want you to spin me on this or on that. But the coin is the property of the owner and the owner spins the coin the way he chooses. That is God's sovereignty. But the owner who is God doesn't just spend us the way he wants to in his sovereignty, but he spends us in his wisdom and understanding of our makeup. And he spends us in his great love for us where he knows we will be blessed, we will be fulfilled, where we will be happier than we ever could have been if we sought our own way and said, spin me this way. The early church got this ownership issue. Acts 4.32 tells us that in the early church, look, look at these words together. 
Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. Now doesn't that sound like, you know, we call it oxymoron or a contradiction? I possess it, but it's not mine. They understood he is the owner, I'm the manager. I'm a steward of what he's placed in my life. And I have to understand ownership. I have to understand stewardship. And I also have to understand the principle of trust. That I trust God the way He wants to spend me. And can God trust me to obey Him and take the things that He's put in my life to further His kingdom so I can become a channel of blessing for His glory. They didn't consider the things that they possessed were their own. They had all things common and with great power. God used that church. And when people lacked, those who were possessors of lands or houses brought those proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed them to everybody that had need. Amen. I'm ahead of the media a little bit. Sorry for racing on ahead. But that's what they did in that early church. They understood if God gave me something and He needs it, I can let it be untied and taken away and never work worry about it it's in better hands with him than it was with me the issue is ownership you see really you can't give what you don't own you're just returning it when I pay tithes those tithes were not mine that first 10% that God blesses me with the increase that I've been tithing on since I was 12 years old, cutting lawns and 16 years old as a bag boy in a grocery store. You don't even have those anymore, hardly. That, that tithe that my parents taught me to do, those good saints in a church, my dad who was a carpenter, my mom, stay-at-home mom, we didn't have a lot of stuff. We weren't poor, we weren't rich, but we understood ownership. The issue is ownership. That that tithe is not even mine. It belongs to the Lord. And I just grew up returning that to the Lord. And understanding that if God needs my time, it belongs to Him. If God needs my money, it belongs to Him. If God needs my life, and He asked for my life in full-time ministry, my life belongs to Him. And now my wife and I raised three sons, but our sons belong to Him. And all of them are involved in ministry because they were raised in an environment where we understood ownership, that our house is not our own. Our cars are not our own. They are dedicated to the Lord. All the things that I have are gifts from God. And if He decides to untie them from me and use them for His purpose, I need to live with a loose hand, not a tight grip on what I have but with the loose hand that if he wants it it's his why don't we praise the Lord right now why don't you open your heart to Jesus Christ who is speaking in this house today the Lord has need of him the issue is ownership Matthew 6 19 on the screens Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Laying up would be having excess stuff. Not just having your needs met or planning for retirement, but just laying up. Because moth and rust can destroy and thieves can break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus said, you can put this on the earth. You can trust the stock market. You can trust your IRA or your 401k. But if you'll put it in heaven, you will never see attrition. You will never see it pilfered away. It never goes down. It always builds equity toward eternity. Amen. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I've had people say before, it's Mission Sunday. I make no apologies for preaching on giving. I believe that giving is a key to blessing and it is a key to revival in a church. And if I didn't practice it, I wouldn't preach it. But I practice it because I've seen it modeled and I know it works. That God will never be indebted to you. Amen? 
He will never be indebted to you. You cannot. And this principle is true. You know, if you won't give, if you don't pay tithes, if you don't give to missions, you're probably not going to be involved and give of your time and your talent because in America, more than any place in the world, perhaps Western Europe, this could be true. Our money is the most precious thing we have. Jesus talked about it all the time. The love of money is the root of all evil. Some people, because they love money, have ensnared themselves. The cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches That's what the Bible calls it When you fall in love with money But when you put your treasure In the kingdom of God Your heart will be there also It always works that way Now wait a second We're talking about my money now Well God doesn't see it that way Look at Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 The Lord said Will a man rob God? Can you imagine somebody who's got a mask, a ski mask over their face and, you know, a Glock in their hand and going up to God and saying, give me your stuff, give me your money. How do you rob God who is invisible, who is all-powerful? How can you rob God? But Malachi said, the Lord says, you, you, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And the Lord says, in tithes, and offerings. Well, say, now wait a second. Are you saying that I rob God when I'm not generous with the kingdom of God and with His local church? That's what the Bible says. Because you've got to get this issue is ownership. And you've got to get it in your head that God will never take from you more than you can afford to give. And He will never owe you. He will always bless you. Look at Luke 6.38. Give. And it shall be given unto you. Wow. Here's a principle. Here's something opposite of the way we think. It ought to say get. And you'll get more. But this principle says given it will be given to you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. And running over. Will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use. It will be measured back to you. And you say, well, I'm going to give to God with a little teaspoon. It will be measured back to you that way. I'm going to give to God with a measuring cup. Good. It will be measured back to you the same way. I'm going to give to God with a giant shovel. Good. It will be given back to you that same way. You see, there's another scripture that says, as your faith is, so be it unto you. And if you've got little bitty stingy faith, go ahead and expect that back. Because however you see generosity with God, the same flows back to you. Give and it shall be given. Wow. Crazy stuff. The issue is ownership. The Lord hath need of it. And you untie it and you let it go. Now, one of my responsibilities in ministry is to serve on our Global Missions Board. And in August of 2009, I was in St. Louis at a uh, summer institute of missions, a missions for the, all the missionaries that come, school of missions. And we had devotions every day. Brother Harry Sism is a retired missionary. His father was a pioneer missionary to India. Brother Sism served in India. And uh, then he became the the director of global missions around the whole world. But now he's retired, and he was speaking to missionary personnel that were in this devotion, I believe on a Thursday morning, but whatever day it was. And he was talking about the missionary problem, the key to the missionary problem. And he was challenging missionaries to trust God. I'm thinking, man, these are the most committed, sacrificial people I know They leave their homeland. They go to a foreign country. They spend their life there. They're separated from their family for years at a time. And here's a man talking to them about sacrifice. I'm feeling smaller and smaller by, you know, as he he teaches. He talks about great moves of God and how missionaries were called. And he asked the missionaries a question. He said, if 
your support from North America dried up and you had no more partners in missions, would you remain on the field and trust God or would you give up and come home because you had no predictable source of income? And I'm thinking to myself, I'm not sure I even know what sacrifice is if he's talking to missionaries like that. And as he's teaching this devotion, something happened to me that changed my life. I will never forget it. In the middle of that devotion, I just saw in my head a vision that God gave me. And that's not like something I say lightly that happens every day to me. It was significant and it was unbelievable to me. And in this vision, I saw a treasure chest. We're going to put this treasure chest up a little higher. I saw a treasure chest. And in this little clip, it was like a little clip that just ran through my mind. I saw that this, this treasure chest had a chain on it. And it had a padlock on it. Got the padlock, got the chain. And there was a guy, I couldn't tell who it was. Kind of like to know, but I didn't think it was representative. There is a person in front of the treasure chest guarding it. And they had a panicked look on their face. As if somebody had walked in and was trying to break into their treasure chest. And they were like, they were just scared to death that somebody was going to get in their treasure chest. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, This is a picture of my people in North America. That's exactly in North America. It wasn't Atlanta West Pentecostal Church, the church that God has privileged me to pastor. He said, this is a picture of my people in North America. They are afraid that I'm going to get into their finances and take more than they can afford to give. They are afraid to give because they don't trust me. The Lord smote my heart. That coming Sunday was to be our sheaves for Christ sacrificial offering. I had a guest preacher that was ministering in our church that day. I got up in front of our church and I just told that simple thing that I told you. And that Jesus went to the treasury one day and he watched how people gave. He watched the rich come in and give token offerings. And he watched a poor widow woman come and give everything she had, all of her money that she was planning to live on that week. And Jesus said that they cast in of their abundance. But she has given all she has, even all of her living. And Jesus said she has given more than all of them. Not because of the amount, but because of the sacrifice. And I said to our church, I do not believe God is so concerned about what you give. He's about what you have. He's concerned about what you have left over. Maybe you can give more. But is that really a sacrifice for you? Is that something that costs you? Or is it something you just gave of your abundance? Is it a token? Or is it truly understanding ownership? And I had them come and open the treasure chest. Stewardship, sacrifice, faith. And in a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity to decide one by one, is the issue ownership with me? Have I settled that issue? Or am I still struggling with who owns the stuff that God has blessed me with? Is it mine or is it him? Is it his? The issue's ownership. Well, I finished my little spiel. They took the offering and... We were going to give in that offering a sacrificial offering to Jesus for Christ. Well, Brother Tisdale, the evangelist, was preaching. He was standing kind of off the platform in the congregation a little bit, and he didn't notice this. But one of my elders, one of the older men in our church, Brother Doyle Tanner, got up from where he was sitting during the preaching. He walked behind Brother Tisdale. He opened his wallet, and he threw something in. I don't know what. Then he went back and sit, sat down. Next, Josh Austin, a guy about our age, got up and Josh was coming up to the treasure chest and Brother Tisdale saw him and he said, wait, hold on a second. 
And he went and got his wallet that he had sent somebody to get out of my office. And he emptied his wallet into the treasure chest. And then while he preached, not on sacrifice, but on faith in God, unrelated to what I was trying to do, people began to come out of our congregation and give. The ushers told me that people went out to their cars and got their checkbooks and wrote checks and came back in and gave. And at the end of that day, when the dust settled and our finance department counted it all up, in that offering, our church gave $70,000 in one church service on one day, just like that. $70,000. Now, the Chiefs of Christ offering ended up being 55000 There was missions money given and other things people did that day. $55,000, mind-blowing. I know our church. I've been there 16 and a half years. I know what good giving is, but that was beyond anything because it broke out of just giving to a spirit of giving. Well, you either got a bunch of rich people or now you've got a bunch of broke people. Neither answer is true. I have some blessed people, but we have no wealthy people in our church. We have a lot of people that understand ownership. Well, I didn't know this, but one of the guys who put a check in the treasure chest was named Carl Franzen. Carl's about 27 years old. He graduated from high school with our middle son, Joel. They're good friends. Carl is a builder. He's a young builder. He apprenticed under a guy that had made a lot of money in Atlanta and learned how to build. And Carl's a perfectionist. And he builds immaculate homes, custom-built homes, 27 years old. But in 2008, in Atlanta, the building boom died. 5.7 million people in our city. But the beginning of 2008, it just went bust. And Carl was plinking along doing some deals, building a few houses here and there. Young man, this is 2012. He's 27 now, so wind the clock back about three years. Here's a young kid, barely, you know, out of high school, just trying to make a living. And Carl, who gave me permission to tell this story, because his brother-in-law is our finance guy, told me, and I have this permission to tell you, but Carl gave that sacrificial offering. And I'm pretty sure he emptied one of his bank accounts in a check and put it in the box. He had a home that was for sale, a pre-sale. So he hadn't built it yet. For nine months, that house had been held up and nothing would go through. The very week he gave that offering. Now I want, you know, your pastor's known me a long time. So you have to understand, I'm not telling the story I heard or read. I'm telling you about a kid that I kind of helped raise. He was either at my house or my son was at his dad's house. We know this boy, okay? This is a real story of a real guy. You can go on the internet to Zinco Homes and you can see his model homes. Carl Franzen. Nine months. The week he gave the offering, the offering, the banker gave the buyer the green light and the deal was done and he sold that pre-sale. He had a second pre-sale that he'd been working on for a long time also. That week, it came through. He had a third pre-sale that came through a week and a half later. A family came to Carl and said, we like the way you build homes. Here's a 24-year-old guy at the time. We like the way you build homes. Here's the plans. We'll give you this price. Just build our home. And that just like that, he had another contract to build a custom home that I'm sure he made quite a bit of money on. He had three spec homes, speculative homes on the market. All three of those homes, a real estate agent sold one spec home right away. He was living in a home he had just built. It was a beautiful home. He was getting married. This was in August. He was getting married in October to Jennifer from Tennessee. He had this house just for her. And somebody came and said, I want to buy the house you're living in. He sold that house and moved into an apartment. What a terrible problem. And when he got married, Jennifer and Carl moved in an apartment while he built another house. 
for them to live in. And they're blessed because they understand that the issue is ownership. I had no idea what Carl did. He didn't raise his hand to a specific amount. He just responded in faith to this understanding that I'm going to open my treasures to God. I will not chain and lock and keep God out. But if he says I need this, the issue is ownership and I will give it. It belongs to him. Amen. Now, I don't know anybody that gets excited about sacrifice, but everybody gets excited about blessing. Where do you think blessing comes from? It comes from sacrifice. When the Lord says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, and offer him on one of the mountains that I will show you. And Abraham, while he, the Lord says, offer him there, Abraham calls it worship and gives his son. And the Lord says, now I know that you love me. And in blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply you. I will make your descendants like the stars of heaven, like the sea, the sand on the seashore for multitude. If you understand sacrifice, then God understands blessing. Amen. I'd like for the musicians to come and give us hope. Several years ago at a general conference for the United Pentecostal Church, I used to produce the foreign mission services. And so we were raising money for crusades, 55, follow the fire crusades around the world. And we had it off stage and figured out and we're going to pray that people would give sacrificially. And, and in that service, I believe we raised $1.2 million for crusades around the world. And our church made a $5,000 commitment their pastor did, and, and we had made a $2,500 pledge to home missions. And up in the balcony at that general conference was a couple in our church that were fine, they're debt-free, they're good stewards, but by no means are they by wealthy. And in that general conference service, the Lord spoke to them, husband and wife discussed it and agreed that we're going to pay our church's $7,500 pledges at, to missions. Now, I didn't know that, but they had a piece of property that they had had on the market for a long time that would not sell. And the next week, I'm not making this up, the next week, it sold. And they made 10 times the amount of their commitment in profit on that piece of property, $75,000 in one deal that would not work until they untied the colt when the Lord said, I have need of $7,500. What the Lord was really saying, I believe, is, you know, I won't call their names because I didn't get permission. I really want to bless you. And what I need you to do is position yourself where I can. And if you will honor me, I will honor you. And if you'll untie that colt and let him go, then I will bless you in a way that you cannot imagine. And since that time, that family has been blessed. And remember I told you about the time, 2008, the, the real estate market crashed in Atlanta? That same guy had just finished the biggest deal of his life, a three-part subdivision. He closed that deal out in December of 2007. And in December, January of 2008, the market crashed. And he told me, Brother Johns, I would have been in such great trouble, but I closed that whole deal before it all shut down. And he made a tremendous profit and was able to invest it in other places. And they've always been generous with our church. We were having a church service one day and it just a spirit of sacrificial giving moved into the church. And through our life, my wife and I have tried to live sacrificially and give generously with our lives, our time, our talent, our treasure. But in that service, the Lord put an amount of money in my mind to give that I have never given. Now, my wife has a lot of faith, but she's more practical sometimes. When I went over there, you know, I'm usually crying. The Lord's talking to my heart. I said, baby, I feel like the Lord wants to give this amount of money. She looked at me like I fell off my rocker, like what in the world happened to you? Go pray again. <laughs> 
How are we going to do that? We, do, we, do we have that much money? And we had saved and saved and saved and saved, and we had that amount of money that I could put my hands on. Well, I was scared. I'd never given that much money before in a sacrificial offering. But that day I did. And after I gave it, I sat down on the front row of the church, and I was just thanking God because, you know, something really cool happens when you untie that colt. Something amazing happens when you let it go, when the Lord says, I have need of it. I was in a moment not of mourning. I was in a moment of joy because I've let go of something that's very precious to me. And while I'm sitting there, a guy in our church comes by, and he's crying. He sits down right next to me. He would have been like here in our church. He sits down next to me, and he hands me a piece of paper. And he said, my wife and I, he said, I feel like the Lord's spoken to my wife and I, and we want to give this in this sacrificial offering. Before God, it was ten times the amount of money that I had committed to God. But I believe when I was willing to just say, okay, go ahead. You know, why are you untying my coal? Why are you taking my money? There's something broke in the spirit, and the needs of our church were met. Because God had something a lot bigger than what He was doing in me. He was moving in the hearts and creating a spirit of giving that affected our church. In just a few minutes, we're going to have an opportunity to come. And as Pastor Reaver told you, I want you to write that final amount. Stewardship, what you know you can do by your budget. Sacrifice, what you're willing to do by giving some things up. It might be a pizza, it might be a new car. It might be a vacation, I have no idea. It's none of my business. It's his business and your business with him. And then what, what do you believe God could do? If you wrote that big check, the biggest one you ever wrote, if you sacrifice in a monthly commitment that you have no idea how you're going to do it, but you're not going to give what you don't have. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying write a hot check, although I've heard that that worked for somebody. I'm not going to try that. I don't want to share that story, but it's an amazing story. You give what you can. Then you say, Lord, if you will bless me, I don't know where it's going to come from. The Bible said he will open to you the windows of heaven. Where is the windows? It's, it's in heaven, and that might show up at work or in some unexpected from some unexpected source. But you know what? I'm not even worried about that because I understand the issue is ownership. When you write that faith commitment and come bring it, we're going to all come. But I want you to just move away and we're going to pray. Because this is a lot bigger than how much money comes in. Your church needs better missions giving so you can meet the needs of the missionaries that you're already committed to. And I can tell you, like one preacher said, I want to tell you all something. I've got good news for you. All the money we need is here today. Now let me tell you the bad news. It's still in your pocket. <laughs> The good news is the money's here. The bad news, it's still tied up with you. But we're going to untie it. And we're going to let God move in Abundant Life Church. And we're going to watch God bless you as you honor Him and understand that the issue is ownership. Would you bow your heads, please? I want to pray for you. Lord, I thank you. Your word says that for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross, despising the shame. And then you were exalted to a position of authority at the right hand of God. And Lord, sometimes we can't see past the cross. That's all we see is the sacrifice. But you saw past the cross. And you saw the glory that was set before you. So today, Lord, we come to the cross, the place of sacrifice and death to ourselves, where we release ourselves into the ownership of God, knowing, Lord, that beyond that, there is blessing exponentially beyond our wildest dreams. You're waiting to give the gift of giving to somebody in this church, but you're waiting for the catalyst gift from them. You want to bless their business. They've got the ability to make money, but things are kind of bound up. They're not working. 
But just like with Carl, Lord, you're able to let all the pieces come together. You're able to unfold something that they never dreamed. But you're waiting for them to die to their own ambitions and ingenuity and ability and let this be an issue of trust where you own their business and you own their finances and you own their future. For when it happens like that, Lord, then you are glorified. And we know that we are successful, not because of anything that we have done, but because we are blessed of God. Because we understand that the issue is ownership. Amen. Would you stand? In no particular order, as you complete your card, And I want to tell you this, and I know how your pastor feels about this. Whether you have something to give or not, if you want to write, not able now, but we'll do my best, you can put that in there. If you need to go home and talk it over, if you haven't done that in the last week since you were given these cards a week ago, you do what you need to do. Because I finished delivering the message the Lord put in my heart for this church. And I believe you've got it. I believe you got it. Amen? Everybody lift your hand and say, I receive the word of the Lord today. I got it. I understand it now that the issue is ownership. Amen. Would you stand when you're through writing down that amount? Would you come drop it in this treasure chest that represents to me an open heart to God that everything I have belongs to Him. Let's watch God work. Let's let the miraculous power of the Lord be demonstrated in this great church. Amen. As they sing, why don't you begin coming? I know you're a little reluctant. You don't want to just give to be seen. We're doing this together as a church family. Amen. Lay me down, I'm not my own. I belong to you alone. Lay me down, lay me down. And on my heart this much is true. There's no from you lay me down lay me there's tithing envelopes if you want to put your cash marked and then put it in there everything in this treasure chest is going to world missions but write checks but there's tithing envelopes ushers please bring more quickly there you go come on stay in the spirit of prayer the Lord has more to do I belong to you Keep praying all across this house. Keep praying. Keep coming. When you come, if you can stay close to the front, or I'm going to call you back anyway, so whatever is convenient for you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's let the Holy Ghost talk to us right now. This is for world missions. This is for Los Angeles. This is for Nigeria. This is for Miami. This is for Philadelphia. This is for Singapore. That's it. All across this house. Hands on my heart, this much is true. There's no life apart from me. is going to give us some more direction. The service is not over. Stay in the spirit of prayer right now. Keep praying. Keep coming. Lord Jesus, 
God, love you today. folks I'm asking you only you can judge this but what is happening in your spirit a few weeks ago faith was so high 10 people received the Holy Ghost we were given missions money to Austria wasn't that a moment but you know what this is still a moment this is a God moment and what the Holy Spirit wants to do today is just a base hit for what He wants. I keep hearing that, untying it, untying it. When God unties that, <laughs> I want to let it go. I say, God, help us to really understand or believe what we're saying. Because some of us are like dead seas over in the Palestine area where, where, where there's no life in that sea because there's no outflow. There's only an inflow and there's no giving back out. And the reason we're so miserable and so much in pain and so into ourselves and just keep bringing all of our needs is because we're not giving out. But something's in our heart today that says, Lord, I've got a spirit of giving. I'm giving this principle. It's not just about money. It's about giving yourself to God. Hallelujah. It's giving time and treasure. There's people in this house that's getting the principle that you're saying, you know what? I've been in debt. I've made some poor choices. I haven't been a good steward of what God's given me. But I'm correcting that so that God in the next few months and years can use me in a way I want to be used. Are you hearing me? So maybe you're not given the greatest sacrificial offering that you will give. But are you getting the principle that I'm aligning myself to God's principles? I'm going to get involved in this. It's a kingdom that will last forever. Hallelujah. Let's reach out and ask God to help us right now to receive this. To receive this. My life is not my own. Maybe God's talking to some of you to just tithe before the Lord. We, we commit in other times. That's not what it's about. But right now there's different principles of tithing and offering and giving of ourselves to Him. Hallelujah. 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 We want to make a commitment to world missions and let God do that through us. But it's not just finances. It's saying, Lord, I want to give them my time. I want to, I want to go out on these Easter outreaches. Some of you that weren't planning on giving an hour and a half of your time in the next two weeks, something's changing. I'm going to get that bulletin. I'm going to be here. I'm going to tell my friends about it. This is about missions. This is about going. And I make no apology about that. I be seat you on the behalf of God to be an ambassador it go to your workplace we need missionaries in our workplaces we need missionaries in our neighborhoods is anybody here in the groan of God are you casual or nonchalant their souls going to hell and by God's grace we're going to pull them out <laughs> Come on, somebody weep for me. You may not have a dime in your pocket, but do you have a passion in your heart? Do you have an intercessory work of the Spirit? You'll say, I'm going to do some outreach. I'm going to make some phone calls. I'm tired of living to myself. That's what it's about. Come on, somebody help me pray. Hallelujah. In August, we're going to take a missions trip to Detroit. Maybe some of you will say in a few weeks on that sign-up sheet, I want to go. I want to do something to make a difference in somebody's life. So now I'm asking you to come. We try to make it clear. It's not too late for you to come and give to the treasure box. But I'm asking you, are you ready to come and present yourself right now? Are you willing to say, Lord, I'm available for whatever you want. If that's you, come. Guest, I'm so glad you're here. You come with us. We'll help you pray about any needs that you have. I told you you're in a unique service where God is challenging us as a church. We're not trying to impose upon our guests. We want to pray for you for healing and deliverance and strength. But at least you should feel encouraged that you're in a church that cares more about the world than they do themselves. 
Do you feel that passion? The reason we go, the reason we give is so that guests can come here and feel the love of God. So church, are you ready to give yourself? Maybe you've already been down here for an offering. I'm asking you to come down for yourself, to present yourself. And do I dare say that's more important than your offering? Does anybody want to come? Stop the music for just a second. Because I'm not, I want to make sure everybody understands. If you are saying, yes, God, I'm available to you for whatever you want, I want you to come. If you're not interested in God using your life, do not come. But if you're interested, come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I'm selfish by nature. You say, Pastor, what's wrong with you? I've got something burning in my heart. There's got to be more than whether somebody spoke to me or, I, or somebody was nice to me. This church is about going and giving. It's not an entertainment center. I want your family to be raised in truth here. But there's something that's bigger than these four walls. And we've got to break the spirit. And we've got to say, Lord, I want to give. You don't even have to just give to this church. Give to your brothers. Give to your sisters. Let there be a spirit of of giving God I'm available to you I believe missionaries can come out of this service I live for the day where we have a fully appointed missionary that was born and raised in this church come on aren't you glad somebody cared about your nation and your neighborhood God get something a hold of us oh God oh God I am not yelling at you. I am not mad at you. I love you. But I believe also you love God. But we get in our own little world. We get into our selfishness and what's happening to us. So what I'm trying to do is shake us in the spirit to say, God, give me a passion beyond just coming to church. (laughs) Who owns your time anyway? Who owns your treasure anyway? Who owns those things? And if you are resisting this right now, I'm trying to help you. It should not hurt. If there's something hurting, pray through that thing. Give it to God. Say, I don't know about all this stuff. Come on, pray through that and say, Lord, abundant life is not just so that I can feel good. It's so that I can make a difference in somebody else. You've heard the gospel so many times, you don't need to hear it again. But somebody else needs to hear it and we've got to pray (laughs) we've got prisons we have not touched are you hearing me we've got neighborhoods we have not touched we've got cultural groups and language groups we have not touched (laughs) say why haven't we touched it pastor maybe it's you that we're waiting on (laughs) maybe it's you that we're waiting on Come on, pray. We're going to minister to one another in a few minutes. And if you need healing or baptism or salvation, God's going to give it to you. Again, guests, feel free to pray as you will. Please understand this pastor is talking to members and attendees that are here. But I want everybody to seek the Lord. I want everybody to pray. I want everybody to care for something besides yourself hear me today it doesn't matter if you've been a part of this church for the 30 years or the last six months or the last 20 years come on this is not a church to entertain us this is a church to get behind the vision a worldwide vision hallelujah hallelujah do not receive from the devil any type of condemnation or that you're in trouble or the pastor's mad that's a lie you're experiencing passion right now you're experiencing desperation right now that something has got to change me I've got to groan I've got to go and I've got to give I need you and you need me that's why we got to give of each other's time we can't just say well I'm here you got to give to one another and to the work of God and loving people as Christ loved you. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you so much, sweet people. Thank you so much for getting under this burden. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for getting under this. I'm not looking at you. Don't look at me or anybody else. This is personal between you and the Lord. Hallelujah. I know you love God. I know God loves you. But somewhere we've got to get under this. And we've got to break the spirit of Laodicea. We've got to have a passion that goes beyond. That's it, that's it, that's it. That's it, Jesus is in the house right now. Hallelujah. You understand it's more than just this service. I already told you we're going to Detroit in August. Maybe you'll want to give of your money to go. Pastor Sistrunk told me there's a lot of people that say they want to come, but they don't come. He wasn't being sarcastic, but something smote my heart. We were trying to go to the Dominican Republic. It didn't feel right. I'm telling you, it's time for some people to get mission minded and go to the inner city of Detroit and give of themselves brother Morgan and I are going to Nigeria just a few weeks after that all I'm trying to tell you is God give us a church that is mission minded and has a world view you don't have to be a rocket science to figure out we need buildings we need money to, to, to facilitate the harvest here but all I know is we've got to do this we've got to do this We've got. God says if you'll just do take care of my work I'll take care of you I'm not trying to barter with God I'm just trusting God <laughs> hallelujah hallelujah would you agree with somebody? It may be your spouse. It may be a friend or a neighbor. It may be somebody you don't know. But would you agree with somebody near you right now? Would you be used of God even right now in the gifts that God has given you to pray for somebody, to encourage somebody, to minister to one another? Lord, I know I can get selfish. I know I can say, God, that's inconvenient. I don't like that about it. But Lord, when I get back to the fact that it was your life, and you didn't have to give it, but you chose to give your life so that I could be saved. Let these people choose to give themselves to a cause that's greater and bigger than themselves. Help us to forgive one another. Help us to love one another. Help us to quit fighting about things that don't matter anyway and get a passion to reach out to somebody that needs it. I'm going to go a step farther. We need Sunday school teachers upstairs. We need more music people. We need more life group facilitators. And it's time for you to rise up and say, God, I'm going to be a part of this. We need office help. You name it. We need it. And you can't just sit there on a pew. You've got to say, God, I've been called to make a difference. Why don't you make the commitment? Some of you are not making the commitment. And that's why you can't respond to some of these things. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. You say, Pastor, well, why don't you let down on the expectations? By God's grace, I know what this Bible calls for. I know what the anointing comes from. Just make the commitment and yield yourself to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. I'm calling you. I'm calling you to anointing. I'm calling you. That's it. Building in grounds. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. But Josh and Quinn and David, when you guys came and cleaned out that house, you will not know what a load it took off this church. I'm trying to tell you, everything's not just treasure chest. Everything's not, are you getting the picture? It's just giving of our time and our treasure and our talents back to him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What has he called you to be? What are the gifts he gave you? Starting a prayer meeting in your home. Telling Sister Joanne, I want to do another group. I want to do something to reach out. I want to make a difference in somebody else's life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I will be what you want me to be. Hallelujah. And if you're here without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's what it's all about. If you're here and your sins have not been repented of, if you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus, if you've not been filled with the Spirit, to me, I don't know where you are, but you can go forth.
Who's on baptism today? All right. Give her instructions, sisters. Help her. Hallelujah. Go to the waters of baptism today. God is in this house. Would you minister to somebody right now? Would you pray for somebody else? Would you encourage somebody else and say, Lord, I'm available. Lord, I'm going to be what you call me to be. I can't be anything else but what you called me to be. That's it. Keep coming. Keep praying. Keep encouraging. Keep giving. What you call oh, yes, me to be I say yes Lord I agree My desire Passionately Is to be What you called me to be That's what I'll be Come on, there's some action steps. You're going to see Brother Jeremy. You're going to see Sister Lisa. You're going to be a part of something in this mission field right here. I'm going to say yes to God. I say yes. Yes, yes, yes. Lord, I agree by desire. Passion and need is to be what you call. Hallelujah. Hey, everybody, I'm trying to give you ideas. Sister Lisa, lift your hand. Brother Nick, lift your hand. It's been in the bulletin for a while. They're trying to start a puppet ministry. They know what they're doing. They've done it before. You know what we want to do with that puppet ministry? We want to be evangelists in this building. We want to go out to Armstead Gardens and other places. Children and adults love puppets. But we need some people to respond to that. Hallelujah. If you want to teach, Sister Lisa, lift your hand. Hallelujah. Right here. Hallelujah. If you want to be a part of music, lift your hand right here. Come on. There's a lot of other places. Media. Brother Adrian, lift your hand. Hallelujah. On and on it can go. Brother Jeremy will help you in all areas. Let's be a missionary here. Let's go to our workplace. Let's give of ourselves. Let's be a part of something. And let's lift our hands and say, Lord, I will be what you call me to be. Yes, yes, yes. I say yes. Lord, I agree. My desire passionately is to be what you call me to be. That's what I'll be. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. I will be what you've called me to be. Hallelujah. I say yes. Lord, I agree. My desire passionately is to be what you've called me Sister Chris, Sister Chris, it doesn't have to be just church-generated activities or programs. Hallelujah. Sister Chris, she has block parties at her own house. She feeds people that need food and clothes people that need clothes. It doesn't come from a church-sponsored event. Are you getting this? I'm not trying to advocate something that just has to come through the reaver thing. This is not about me. It's about the kingdom of God. Get a passion. Get involved. Do something in the kingdom of God. And that's the key. Because you know what? We can get offended. And we can get hurt. And there's Bible ways to resolve that. And you need to do it if you are. But you know what? Blessed are those that are not offended. And I'll tell you one way you can do it is when you get involved in something bigger and say, you know what? You may have hurt my feelings. I forgive you, but it's not worth, hallelujah, stifling my gift. I'm going to be a part of what God is doing in these last days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will be. I can't sing it. Call me to be. Yes. Come on, marinate in it. Receive it. Receive it. Say it. Lord, I agree. Yes, yes. My desire. 
Hallelujah. It's to be what you've called me to be. That's what I'll be. I will be what you've called me to be. I say yes, Lord, I agree, my desire, passionately, is to be what you want me to be, that's what I'll be. Baptizing, tell them to keep on baptizing. You, if you can figure out around here we don't have official dismissals. But if anybody wants prayer today, hear me. If you want to be rescued or delivered from whatever you're going through with the motive that I want to do it, to be a part, whether it's deliverance, financial miracles, whether it's healing in your body, stresses in this life that you want to be free from, so that you can be a part of this vision God's given you. I want you to come down here. Hallelujah. That's the word that God gave Sister Joanne Thursday. That God was going to rescue us quickly. So that we could be a part of a bigger vision. Are you hearing me? God loves you enough to help you and bless you the way you are right now. But the difference is, I want to be relieved of this. So that, not just so I can feel good. But so that I can do something greater in the vision that God has given us as a church. Hallelujah. So if you're here today and there's stresses in your life. There's physical conditions. There's financial things. There's stuff there that you you want to be free from so that you can give yourself to the passion that you feel in your spirit does that make sense if you want to be free from those things it doesn't matter what it is if it's unforgiveness or grudges or or just physical ailments i want you to come down to the front right now hallelujah now those that are here i want some saints of god to come around and we're going to pray for each one of these and the motive is god i'm not trying to do this just so I can feel good but I want to give myself hallelujah saints of God wave at me I need some help up here I want everybody to have somebody one two three four five six seven eight nine ten all right there they are all right I need right here there's three right here hallelujah I need some saints of God here to pray hallelujah that's it come on that's awesome that's awesome that's it they're coming that's it if you gotta go 
If you have to leave, we understand. But we see God do much things in the afterglow of the Holy Ghost. That's it. Now by the power that's in the name of Jesus and the authority that's in the Word of God, I bind every physical ailment, mental or emotional harassment, financial obstacle and set them free so that they can be a part of the vision that God has called this church to. Let God arise in every one of these sweet people's life. Thank you church. Thank you church. Something's happening in the Holy Ghost. Something's happening in the Holy Ghost. I submit to it, Lord. I agree with it. I believe, Jesus. I receive right now. Yes!
the name of Jesus.